It would be the best way of breaking the trust that the people have with the idea that the NSA are, are so well funded because they are protecting the people. My point is to start publicly accusing them of, uh, of uh, uh, accessories in the murders that are occurring by negligence. What did you do at the NSA? Should we start there? For about 30 years, I was a, a primary analyst against the Soviet Union, uh, breaking ciphers and codes and things like that, and then also data systems, data looking at structures and organizations in their military, uh, and uh, actually figuring out what they were doing and intending to do before they did it. But then uh, later in my career, I became the uh, technical director of the world within NSA. So I had to look at all the technical problems around the world. First of all, as the technical director of the world, the, the biggest problem was the digital age and the explosion of communication. So I had to figure out how can we deal with that. So the whole idea was how could we automate the processing of data out of the uh, digital age. That plus, uh, well, that built social networks, for example. That meant, in the military sense, that was the command structure. And most of that was done with metadata. And then nowadays, with, with the Edward Snowden leaks, people are talking a lot about metadata. And you have them saying, oh, well, it's only metadata we're collecting. That's the, what they're trying to dupe everybody into thinking that is nothing. And the difference between metadata and data, I would make, is yeah. pretty simple. In data, what that means, I'm looking at your conversation, yeah. listening to it, or looking or reading a transcript or I'm reading your emails, or your file transfers, or your short messages, or anything that you're doing on the web, seeing what you're querying, things like that, that's the data. Uh, that gives me information about you for that period of time. Metadata gives me the view of who you're doing with all over, all the time. Your entire community I can get from metadata, and how you relate with them. And I can, uh, just by looking at who you're talking to, I can see, do things like say, you're having medical problems, and it's this kind of problem because you're, you're, you're talking to this kind of uh, doctor. Or you're planning a trip and you're going here because you used your credit card over there. That's metadata, yeah. right? Not data, content. So it, it, you can tell an awful lot about a person and how they operate and, and actually uh, what they're about to do. So those, those are the kinds of questions you can ask, answer with metadata. They use terrorism as the excuse to do it, but they were really doing it for the police. Well, they collect it and store it primarily so that they can retroactively analyze anybody they want. And that's what law enforcement wants to do. They want to go in and look at anybody that they think is doing a crime of some sort or other. And having all this data there all the way back for years will allow them to retroactively analyze them and who they've been talking to, working with, and what their relationships were over that period of time. You said that um, the way data is currently collected has made it more difficult to prove attacks. Then, then why do they continue to do this? For the money. It's all about money. How, how much money are we roughly <coughs> talking about here? Uh, for the intelligence community, uh, I reckon it's a little over $100 billion a year. They want an ever-increasing budget, so that means they have to commit themselves to collecting everything, yeah. which is an ever-increasing amount. That requires an ever-increasing amount of money. It sounds like capitalism, you know, constant growth, assumed constant growth. Well, it sounds like yeah, but the, only difference is, but the only difference is that uh, all the taxpayers and the schmucks are going to pay for it, right? <laughs> And they don't know what they're paying for. What they're paying for is more data that gets dumped on their analysts than they can't figure it out anyway. So in the end, what that means is people die first, then they go into the massive data they have on everybody, and if they can identify who it was and that, did, it, that uh, did the attack, then they mine them specifically, and they had all kinds of data on them, they, and they can see their entire community, then they go after them. But that's the reverse of how they should do it. They should target them so they can stop them before they attack. The narrative of the NSA, if we break it down into two broad chunks, is, is pre-9-11 and post-9-11. Is that, is that a fair analysis, would you say? No, I think they were planning to do uh, bulk acquisition even before 9-11. Uh, uh, the evidence for that is the uh, court case uh, for um, the, the CEO of Quest, Joe Naccio. Uh, he, he and his lawyers had documented in that court case that he was approached on the 27th of February of 2001 six months plus before 9-11 to turn over all the data on his customers by NSA. So that gave an indication that they wanted to do that even before 9-11. So in a way, they're using 9-11 and these kind of these, these horrific attacks to benefit themselves more than even the people committing them. Absolutely. 
9-11 was a gift to NSA, because now we'll get all the money we, can, we could ever hope for. They're responsible for it. I mean, because they knew the people before the attacks, and they didn't stop them. These people were tracked constantly. They had all the information on them. They were stopped by police and several times in cars. They knew they were attending flight schools and never asked me how to land a plane. All these things that would, that would lead to if you were using this information correctly. Um, so that, that, that would lead us to think that even when the information is gathered and collected and organized, even then it's almost useless. Is it useless or is it, is it sort of willfully ignored? You could look at it that way. I don't know that they consciously did that, no. but subconsciously, you know, you know, I don't think they had any fear in them, you know. Every time there's an attack though, look at what they start saying. Well, we need more data, uh, we need more money, that's what they really want, and we need more people, build an empire. And, and to get the more money, they, they need to fuel the, the people's fear and so they use a lot of racist propaganda to do this. They're creating fear about uh, losing the power grid, the terrorism, you know, it's getting worn and old. So you've got to have bigger and yeah, better villains, yeah. like, you know, we've got ISIS now, and Russia's looking like a, a coming back as a and villain. The Chinese. And the Chinese. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of players, there's a lot yeah. of potential threats. Well, for cybersecurity, it's everybody, yeah. I'm just curious about what a black budget, like, what, what it means for it to be black. Where does the money actually come from? So is it tax dollars or does it come from somewhere else? How, is, is the amount ever known? The black budget are basically to programs that they have wanted limited knowledge of to in the, even in Congress. So it's money from tax dollars and it's a known amount, but, it does it, but what isn't known is what it's spent on. Well, beyond the original allocation, uh, they can't track it. What would be the best way of breaking the trust that the people have? with the idea that the NSA are, are, are so well funded because they are protecting the people. My point is to start publicly accusing them of, uh, of uh, uh, accessories in the murders that are occurring by negligence. So before you left it, it was, it was all right, you know, it was completely ethical. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was more right than wrong. After I left, it was wrong, wrong, wrong. In your talk, you mentioned how in your case, you, you threatened to counter sue. Or, or counter prosecute the government. They didn't like me talking about uh, their misdoings, you know, all the crimes they were committing and the uh, violations of the Constitution. I was discussing that with the members of Congress. They didn't want that happening because Congress might act, take action against them. So they didn't want that to happen. Uh, they also didn't want uh, any of the knowledge to be spread around anything outside of the uh, Judiciary Committees or outside of the FISA court. So we were preparing to go, to we went to people like the inspector generals of the <clears throat> Department of Defense and the Department of uh, Justice. They didn't want that happening. So what that did was they raised our profile to them. So we said, hey, these people are really causing trouble and we have to get rid of them. What would you say about um, people using Facebook and people using all of these other things online? Um, what advice would you give to them? You never do. Never, Never give do. away any of your private, personal information. You have to assume that if you put information out there that there's a lot of people going to read it. And there are people going to collect it and sell it, mainly Facebook. In other words, you're doing work for Facebook for free. FBI looks at Facebook as one of their best sources of information. Yeah. So whatever you've done there, you can't erase. It's all, always there. Well, they would scrape the whole thing. It's like they did with the muscular program. Uh, the, the whole idea was to take uh, Google, Yahoo, all of them, and put uh, unilateral taps on the fibers between their data centers. So that any time they'd pass data back and forth, and they did it in mass to back it up, they would capture everything. So th they capture it, then store it in Utah or other places. Uh, uh, and uh, Utah is a one million square foot facility. They're now building a 2.8 million square foot facility on Fort Meade. That, to my mind, is to replace Utah when it's full in about five years. What kind of things can we expect from the NSA in the future? I think they're only going to get worse because uh, all these electronic gadgets are coming out. The point is that uh, for this iPhone, yeah. they, want, uh, they want Apple <laughs> to disengage uh, the password protection techniques that they have on it so that yeah. they could mass attack and get the password. And Apple is surely being very disingenuous trying to protect the privacy of their customers. Yeah. So what, what do you think about this case? To a certain degree that there is still a bit of protection. The, the reason they're really going for it is because NSA has, with GCHQ, have the billions of SIM cards that they've collected every year produced by uh, different companies in the Netherlands and so on. Yeah. Uh, that gives them, uh, the SIM card gives you the uh, subscriber ID and the 
the uh, equipment access code, meaning your cell access code, your computer. So what that means is they can access your device through the network wherever you are and uh, <clears throat> try to break your password once they remove all the pr protections. Yeah. They could brute force your password and then download your whole device wherever you are in the world. So they want to use this case to get access yeah. to everyone else's. Yeah. And then they could do it in mass. Yeah. Mass up computers and mass attack all the iPhones in the world. This isn't just if you're using certain websites or if you're using a, you're using a phone in a certain, you know, some people like to think, oh no, that wouldn't affect me. Well, you'll never know it. Okay, you'll never know they downloaded. But, but assume that if you're using any of this technology, <laughs> it is a, it is it is one. Absolutely, to you. absolutely. Democracy means that we have to keep on, that we have to get engaged all the time.